I'm Tony Zambodi. I'm a mechanical engineer from the Philadelphia area with over 20 years of experience in the aerospace industry where I design structures for aircraft and spacecraft and support equipment. I started looking at uh, the uh, building collapses that occurred in New York City on September 11, 2001 after reading a paper from a BYU physics professor, Dr. Stephen Jones, where he discussed uh, <clears throat> what seems to be a large, huge amounts of molten metal found in the rubble of, of just the three buildings that collapsed. Um, after reading Dr. Jones's paper, I was taken aback, um, obviously shocked, and decided I needed to look at this myself. And uh, that started four years ago in early 2006. Since then, I've written several papers uh, due to my own research on the subject, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, what we've been told uh, as to how these buildings did collapse is false. It's uh, unfortunately not the way it occurred. And uh, something I've done uh, in the last few months was ri written up a uh, series of 24 substantiatable points which show that uh, the leaders of the NIST World Trade Center investigations were less than forthright in their analysis and that they themselves should be investigated for this reason. I just want to briefly get into each one of these points. Uh, the first point is uh, concerns uh, the fact that NIST claims that World Trade Center 1, the collapse initiated due to the south exterior wall buckling. The report claims this was due to inward bowing of the exterior columns that they allege bowed inwardly due to uh, sagging main floor trusses. And uh, <clears throat> there's a good bit of concern there because if you do your own analysis on these floor trusses, you find that they don't sag nearly as much as the NIST purports them to at the temperatures at 700 degrees centigrade. I've done an analysis on that and they only sag a couple inches. And they're saying they're sagging 40 plus inches. And this did a testing with uh, underwriter laboratories, they contracted with them uh, as part of their report, and uh, lo and behold, the trusses did not sag that much. And uh, this sort of walked around that and claimed that the reason that the trusses didn't sag in the test was that they had fireproofing on them, and that the reason the ones in the tower would have sagged is that they, the fireproofing would have been knocked off. Uh, you need to bear in mind that the south wall was completely on the opposite side of where the aircraft impact occurred. So that in itself should lend one, lead one to sort of be concerned about that. It's very difficult to knock all that fireproofing off all the way on the other side of these over 70 yards wide buildings. And what this doesn't do, in addition to that, they try to say that these, uh, these floor trusses would have caused them to sag, but there's a problem with it in the sense that they you need about the weight of that's on 12 trusses to cause them to sag that much. So what they do in their analysis is, is say that several disconnected, like 10 of them, 10 or 11 disconnected and put the load on one. But their problem there is then, then why wouldn't the bolts that connect them to the outside wall column fail if they have the load of 12 on that one? Why did all the other, the earlier 11 fail but this one didn't fail? It's sort of a dichotomy going on there. In addition to that, um, the NIST model could not get the wall to fail with natural inputs. They had to add a horizontal force on the, on the columns to get them to buckle. So even in their model, it shows the sagging floor trusses could not cause it. They couldn't get it to happen with natural inputs. Uh, I think that's a very serious issue, and it shows a lack of engineering rigor. And the second point uh, to be made is that uh, and this report does not provide a technical analysis of the structural behavior of the building during the collapse itself. They stopped their analysis where they say the south wall buckled. And then they depend on a professor, a civil engineering professor from Northwestern University, Dr. Zednik Bazant, who did an analysis where he claims a progressive collapse could collapse the building. But he starts his analysis after a one-story fall. So here we have a gap between this alleged south wall buckling, what isn't explained is the propagation across the rest of the building before it falls one story. Nobody explains that. That's completely left open in the NIST report. They have not explained it. And it's important to know that. The third point uh, sort of ties in with that second point, 
and that in their analysis, uh, NIST does show what the uh, additional loads on other parts of the structure would be if the south wall had, bu had buckled. And they provide the additional, analysis, uh, additional loads on the east and west perimeter columns. The problem for their analysis is that these loads do not cause anywhere near a failure condition in those east and west perimeter wall columns. So uh, there needs, that needs to be looked at itself. I, th again, this does not support their contention that this instability spread across this building. They just don't have any numbers that can support that. Uh, the fourth point covers something else that NIST does in their, uh, their initiation analysis. They claim that the building tilted eight degrees to the south towards this buckling south face and then began its descent. Many people have looked at this now, and uh, this provides no analysis of their own, but individual researchers have shown, you can measure it, that the building tilted one degree at most prior to descending several stories, and only then did it tilt eight degrees. So this is completely an error here and provides no analysis otherwise. Point five concerns Dr. Bazant's uh, papers where he claims an amplified dynamic load would have occurred at impact. Uh, what many people don't realize is these buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. And in fact, in the towers, the central core had a factor of safety of three to one against gravity collapse, and the perimeter columns five to one when you were only considering gravity, because they also had to be designed for high wind loading and seismic loads. Well, there was no earthquakes and there was no high winds on September 11, 2001, so those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. So that load above them, as you can see, had no chance to collapse the lower portion of the building, unless, and this is a big if, unless there was an impact with a deceleration. What happens there is the force is amplified, and it's amplified because the deceleration is many times the rate of gravity. What has to happen, though, and you heard me use the word deceleration, is that the Ob impacting object has to decelerate. And when it decelerates, it loses velocity. Well, the drop of the upper section of the North Tower or World Trade Center One has been measured by a large number of people now. There is no deceleration. Dr. Bazant never measured that. He just assumed that there was a deceleration and what he considered a, a very large jolt. A very powerful jolt is the way he termed it. The fact that there is no deceleration shows that there was no impulsive load or amplified load. Um, some people try to, to defend, apologists for the present official story, try to defend this by saying that the building tilted. Well, I, as I explained in the, in the uh, point four, just a few minutes ago, there is no large tilt prior to this building coming down straight for several stories. It's a very small tilt, if any. It comes down several stories and then tilts. So that point is refuted. Uh, other people try to say that the uh, impacts on the outside of the wall would have, would have somehow been attenuated. Well, there's demolitions uh, done in France which use what we call the Vernage te technique, where they take out a couple floors worth of columns with hydraulics. They take the columns out and they let the building, the upper section of the building drop two full floors. That's somewhere around 25 feet. It's a significant drop of a large mass. And you can measure it. And when it impacts the lower section, there's a very definitive, observable jolt, deceleration, and velocity loss. And you can see it in the graph. It is not there in the case of the North Tower. The next point uh, I discuss the NIST claimed that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. However, when you watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center One, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself. Its lower stories are breaking up before it even impacts the lower section. It appears to be a controlled demolition of its own, of the upper section, and that would be done to generate momentum of that upper section before it contacts the lower section. Point seven discusses the fact that NIST acknowledges in their response to a request for correction that they are unable 
to provide a full explanation of the total collapse. Yet they refused to consider the possibility that explosives or some other form of demolition device could have been used to cause the collapses of the towers. And the fact that controlled demolition is consistent with all the available technical evidence. The request for correction was filed by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth and many others who simply don't believe that the collapse has been explained properly. And the response to that request for correction is this simply saying they're unable to provide a full explanation for the total collapse, even though that was their, their uh, task given to them by Congress. Point eight it concerns uh, the NIST testing of the uh, Twin Tower floor assemblies done at Underwriters Laboratories under contract to NIST. This was done per ASTM E119 in a two-hour, 2,000-degree fire test. During the test, the main trusses sagged approximately four inches after 60 minutes and six inches after 100 minutes, which were the approximate durations of the fires in World Trade Center One and Two, or World Trade Center Two and One, respectively. Yet NIST had the main trusses sagging well over 40 inches in their models, where they had also removed the bridging trusses between the corner perimeter. They didn't account for the effect of the bridging trusses being removed in their global model, even though they claimed they would earlier in the report. In addition to that, analysis of the main trusses show a deflection of just two inches with their normal floor load at 700 degrees centigrade. To gain a sag over 40 inches, NIST claims that several main trusses were caused to disconnect from the exterior columns and then applied over 10 additional normal floor loads to the few remaining connected trusses. One is then left to wonder how the claim can be made that a few sagging trusses could pull in the entire perimeter wall or any large section of it, as the connection of these few remaining trusses to the perimeter wall would not have withstood this load. In other words, they're making the claim that all these other trusses disconnected so that they can overload this one, but they're saying it wouldn't disconnect. There's a dichotomy there in my mind. Point nine discusses the fact that NIST owned testing for actual steel temperatures one of the pieces they did get from the Twin Towers had experienced temperatures over 250 degrees centigrade, where steel has not lost any strength yet. And none had experienced temperatures beyond 600 degrees centigrade, where steel loses about half its strength. So bear in mind, less than 1.5% of the steel that NIST actually got showed that it experienced any temperatures where steel would actually lose strength. 98.5% of the steel they got showed it would not lose, it had not lost, had not experienced temperatures where it would lose any strength at all. The areas the steel came from that NIST did their testing on came from, according to them, the fire affected areas. Yet these members did not, had not experienced high temperatures <clears throat> that would be expected in something that would have catastrophically collapsed. In fact, like I said earlier, they didn't experience temperatures that would cause them to lose strength in 98.5% of the cases. So it's hard to say how, how this the structure actually lost strength. This deal was all selected from the areas that were affected by the jet fuel from the aircraft impacts and subsequent fires. This calculates what they call DCR, which is a demand to capacity ratio. Many people are familiar with the term factor of safety. The towers are built to withstand several times the load above them. If it was three times the load above them, the factor of safety would be three to one. They do what they call the DCR, and that's actually reciprocal, where the demand is, would be, in that case, would be one third of the capacity. It would be a factor of safety of three to one would be a DCR of 0.33. That means the demand was only 0.33 or 33% of the capacity. But what they do, they do something, I think, that's disingenuous. When you design for a worst-case scenario, you're putting the maximum possible loads on it. And that's not always what exists. Um, that's what they determine their factor of safety or demand to capacity ratio from, the absolute worst-case loads that the tower would ever experience. But that's not what was actually on those buildings. In fact, the demand that was on those buildings was probably about two-thirds or less than the worst-case design load. 
The factor of safety of the core is in fact three to one with the actual in service loads on it and the perimeter columns five to one. Yet NIST shows a factor of safety in the core of somewhere around 1.92 to two to one. And that's erroneous. It's actually higher than that. What they were doing here was trying to show, I believe, trying to show that the buildings would be more susceptible to failure than they actually were. This admits that uh, only a quarter to half a percent of the steel from the towers was safe for analysis. Dr. John Gross, one of the project leaders, has admitted being in the yards, picking pieces of safe for analysis, but the report doesn't explain why so little was saved. Interestingly, when the seal the steel that was safe in the towers did not show it had experienced high temperatures, the report was dismissive. They were saying that sample size was not sufficient to be rep representative. Well, it would seem that Dr. Gross would have been involved in determining what to save and what not to. Why wouldn't the sufficient sample size be saved? And why wasn't, at the very least, all the steel from the impact and fire affected areas salvaged for analysis? Nobody does a forensic analysis in this matter, you always save for, for uh, physical evidence. The, the amount of space required to store this amount of material would not have been significant relative to the issue that would be resolved. And this does not explain the yellow-orange fluorescing molten metal that was observed coming out of the damaged corner, damaged northeast corner of the South Tower on the opposite side of the aircraft hit. In a frequently asked questions, uh, Point, they claimed that it could have been aluminum. But this was uh, tested by Dr. Stephen Jones. He melted aluminum, and this had claimed that it could have been fluorescing orange-yellow because of organics that would have mixed in with it, rugs, drapery, things like that. So Dr. Jones did that, and it turns out that these organics simply float to the top. They don't mix with the molten aluminum. Molten aluminum fluoresces silvery gray not orange-yellow. The orange-yellow had to be iron and or steel. So they haven't explained that, and um, the significance here is that the maximum temperatures which can be achieved by diffuse flame hydrocarbon or office fires is about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and that can be proven. This is well below the 2,750 degree Fahrenheit melting temperature of steel. There's been no further response from this on this issue. This is acknowledged in their final report on World Trade Center 7 now that the building fell at full free fall acceleration for two and a quarter seconds. During this time, in a free fall, that building would have fallen at least 80 feet in full free fall. And that's over six stories. Yet there's no attempt in the re report to confront the implications of this. The fall is dramatic. And the whole building completely comes down in one continuous motion. There couldn't have been any structural resistance during this six-story fall. It's completely impossible. And this themselves have to recognize the implications of this. The fact that they haven't is fraudulent. The exterior of the NIST World Trade Center 7 computer simulation model, which they put together to try to explain their theory, shows large, very large deformations which are not observed in the video of the actual event. Yet they don't attempt to explain this in the report on why their model doesn't represent or replicate reality. Uh, usually models, computer models in engineering have to represent or replicate the real event. So the fact that it doesn't shows that it's not indicative of what actually happened. What actually happened was the exterior of the building comes down fully, symmetrically, and at one time. Both sides of the building come down completely and in a total free-fall acceleration for over two seconds. This is fully indicative of full structural support being removed for at least six stories. That could not happen by fire. What's actually happened with the NIST computer model, it's behaving like a natural collapse would. It would be deforming the exterior of the building if the whole interior was collapsing prior to the exterior. What we're seeing is what would happen in a natural collapse and what we saw, what we see on the real video is not a natural collapse. In this World Trade Center 7 report presentation in August of 2008 and in their 
April 21st, 2009, frequently asked questions. They state that they have investigated whether World Trade Center 7 could have been brought down by controlled demolition and that they have concluded it was not. They state this, although they admit they did not test for explosive residues in the rubble or dust of any of the three collapsed buildings. They also admit that no steel whatsoever was saved from World Trade Center 7 for analysis. Their conclusions are based on the, on the claim that there were no sound levels measured, which they feel would be indicative of the size of an explosion needed to destroy the column that they say collapsed initially in World Trade Center 7, column 79, which is on the northeast corner of the core in that building. And they say that rigging the building in an undetected way would be difficult. They also dismissed the use of incendiaries based on the amount of, of it needed to destabilize column 79 and alleged it would be difficult to bring in the building undetected. In contrast to their argument <clears throat> that it would be difficult to rig World Trade Center 7 without being detected, many people are aware, although may, many would not be aware, that there was a secret retrofit of the Citibank Tower in New York City itself in 1978. Apparently there was an engineering error which could have allowed the building to topple in 70 mile per hour, per hour winds on the structural frame. In that case, secret C was maintained if the problem was realized and the repairs were made at night, all during the summer and into the fall of 1978. They didn't want the building occupants and nearby residents to panic when there was actually no danger and an evacuation plan for the building was drawn up with the intent to implement if high winds were imminent. So here we had a large skyscraper retrofitted in secret in New York City in 1978, and it wasn't made public until many years later. So that sort of refutes this claim that it would be difficult to bring these things into the building. That was done before and it's known. This claims that the reason column 79 collapsed was that the girder attached to it and to the northeast wall was pushed by beams from the east side and it walked off its it walked off its seat on column 79. What would have prevented this is shear studs that are attached to the top of the beam and up into the concrete. However, even though in their earlier draft report this said that there were shear studs on the girders and the beams outside of the core, they're now claiming they weren't on the girders outside the core. This is a change in what they're saying, and it's, uh, it has to create suspicion. It doesn't make sense that there would be no shear studs on both the girders and the beams, as that's standard practice in the industry. A Freedom of Information Act request to NIST by a registered structural engineer for calculations and analysis substantiating the walk-off failures of the horizontal girders from their seats at columns 79 and 81 was denied by NIST with the claim that releasing this data might jeopardize public safety. That's simply incredible. How could it possibly jeopardize public safety to tell people in the industry, engineers who were responsible for designing these buildings, how this failure could occur? And they refused to release their analysis and calculations, which makes engineers wonder if they actually have something to substantiate it. It needs to be mentioned that NIST has also repeatedly refused to release computer input data um, that was requested through the Freedom of Information Act from them in the past concerning World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7. Another very interesting point is that FEMA in their report, there was apparently one piece of steel saved from World Trade Center 7 and the scientists who examined it said that there was rapid oxidation, sulfidation, and intergranular melting at a melting point much lower than what could happen with steel, which indicates there was eutectic involved, which is a chemical mixture designed to make a substance melt at a lower point. And sulfur does that when it's added to thermite. This was not included, and this did not pick up on this, even though the Scientists involved in the FEMA report recommended future studies on this. This did not pick up on this and did not further this investigation. The fact that NIST did not include any discussion whatsoever about this piece 
that exhibited this intergranular melting, rapid oxidation and sulfidation in their report after it had been recommended that it be looked at, that it was quite a mystery, is essentially fraudulent and it's probably criminal. And yet that's what we have. This did not discuss this in the report whatsoever. Aside from this one small piece that was found to have intergranular melting, incredibly none of the steel, none of the other steel from World Trade Center 7 was saved for analysis. This is disconcerting considering World Trade Center 7 would have been the first steel frame high-rise building in history to ostensibly collapse due to fire. Dr. John Gross was involved in the selection of the pieces of steel saved for the NIST investigations and the failures of all three buildings. In their final report in November 2008 on World Trade Center 7, NIST makes no mention of the fact that no steel was saved from World Trade Center 7 for analysis. The fire severity and durations shown in NIST reports for all three buildings don't match observation. Uh, World Trade Center 7, NIST claims the fires were very large and very, very hot and long-lasting, when in, in reality, observation, which has been researched by many people, shows these fires did, were, did not last very long. They were not in the locations where NIST claims they were at given times. In the case of the South Tower, there's even radio calls by firemen saying the fires were small and that they were easy to control, relatively easy to control. This was a few, few minutes before the tower actually collapsed. In spite of numerous eyewitnesses testifying to evidence that molten iron and steel was in the rubble of just the three collapsed buildings, Dr. John Gross of NIST is on video denying that there is any evidence of this and that he hasn't heard of anybody having seen it or observed it. There are firemen on video saying they observed molten iron and steel running like lava from a volcano down the channel ways when you got down below in these collapsed buildings. The significance here is that maximum temperatures which can be achieved by diffuse flame hydrocarbon fires are 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and well below the 2750 degree Fahrenheit melting temperature of steel. NIST has no ability to answer this question. That's obviously why John Gross is denying its existence. NIST has now admitted that they did not test for explosives, and their director of public relations is on record as saying, if you're going to test for something that is not there, you're wasting your time and taxpayers' money. In the oral histories of the emergency personnel taken down in late 2001, in early 2002, there are over 100 individuals who make comments about seeing, hearing, and feeling explosions in those buildings. These oral histories were documented well before NIST started their World Trade Center investigation in September 2002. This testimony should have caused the presumption that there was a good chance explosive residue would be found and justified testing for it rather than the opposite. Well, on what basis would NIST have presumed there was little chance of explosive residue to be found and that it would be a waste of time and money. Neither NIST or FEMA followed standard protocol for fire and explosion investigations, or just fire investigations for that matter. National Fire Protection Association Guide Number 921 calls for saving the evidence and being prepared to, be, to justify why you wouldn't. It also calls for testing for in accelerants and explosives when high order damage is involved. NIST did not do this. NIST is often responsible for generating information which the NFPA guides are written from. It makes one wonder why the NFPA standard would not be followed in this case. NIST has not answered this question publicly. I'd like to ask you to join myself and over a thousand other architectural and engineering professionals who are demanding a new, independent, and impartial investigation with subpoena power into just exactly how these three buildings came down. <laughs>